Chapter One of Beverly of Graustark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Beverly of Graustark by George Barr McCutcheon. Chapter One East of the Setting Sun. Far off in the mountain lands, somewhere to the east of the setting sun, lies the principality of Graustark, serene relic of rare old feudal days. The traveller reaches the little domain after an arduous, sometimes perilous journey from the great European capitals, whether they be north or south or west, never east. He crosses great rivers and wide plains. He winds through fertile valleys and over barren plateaus. He twists and turns and climbs among sombre gorges and rugged mountains. He touches the cold clouds in one day and the placid warmth of the valley in the next. One does not go to Graustark for a pleasure jaunt. It is too far from the rest of the world and the ways are often dangerous because of the strife among the tribes of the intervening mountains. If one hungers for excitement and peril, he finds it in the journey from the north or the south into the land of the Graustarkians. From Vienna and other places almost directly west, the way is not so full of thrills, for the railroad skirts the darkest of the danger lands. Once in the heart of Graustark, however, the traveller is charmed into dreams of peace and happiness and paradise. The peasants and the poets sing in one voice and accord, their psalm being of never-ending love. Down in the lowlands and up in the hills, the simple worker of the soil rejoices that he lives in Graustark. In the towns and villages the humble merchant and his thrifty customer unite to sing the song of peace and contentment. In the palaces of the noble the same patriotism warms its heart with thoughts of Graustark, the ancient. Prince and pauper strike hands for love of the land, while outside the great, heartless world goes rumbling on, without a thought of the rare little principality among the eastern mountains. In point of area, Graustark is but a mite in the great galaxy of nations. Glancing over the map of the world, one is almost sure to miss the infinitesimal patch of green that marks its location. One could not be blamed if he regarded the spot as a typographical or topographical illusion. Yet the people of this quaint little land hold in their hearts a love and a confidence that is not surpassed by any of the lordly monarchs who measure their patriotism by miles and millions. The Graustarkians are a sturdy, courageous race. From the faraway century when they fought themselves clear of the Tartar yoke to this very hour, they have been warriors of might and valour. The boundaries of their tiny domain were kept inviolate for hundreds of years, and but one victorious foe had come down to lay siege to Idlewise, the capital. Axfan, a powerful principality in the north, had conquered Graustark in the latter part of the nineteenth century, but only after a bitter war in which starvation and famine proved far more destructive than the arms of the victors. The treaty of peace and the indemnity that fell to the lot of vanquished Graustark have been discoursed upon at length in at least one history. Those who have followed that history must know, of course, that the reigning princess, Yetiv, was married to a young American at the very tag end of the nineteenth century. This admirable couple met in quite romantic fashion, while the young sovereign was travelling incognito through the United States of America. The American, a splendid fellow named Laurie, 
was so persistent in the subsequent attack upon her heart, that all ancestral prejudices were swept away, and she became his bride with the full consent of her entranced subjects. The manner in which he wooed and won this young and adorable ruler forms a very attractive chapter in romance, although unmentioned in history. This being the tale of another day, it is not timely to dwell upon the interesting events which led up to the marriage of the Princess Yetive to Grenfell Lorry. Suffice it is to say that Lorry won his bride against all wishes and odds at the same time, won an endless love and esteem from the people of the little kingdom among the eastern hills. Two years have passed since that notable wedding in Idlewes. Lorry and his wife, the princess, made their home in Washington, but spent a few months of each year in Idlewise. During the period spent in Washington and in travel, her affairs in Graustark were in the hands of a capable, austere old diplomat, her uncle, Count Caspar Halfont. Princess Volga reigned as regent over the Principality of Axphain. To the south lay the Principality of Dorsbergen, ruled by young Prince Danton, whose half-brother, the deposed Prince Gabriel, had been for two years a prisoner in Graustark, the convicted assassin of Prince Lorenz of Axphain, one-time suitor for the hand of Yeti. It was after the second visit of the lorries to Idlewise that a serious turn of affairs presented itself. Gabriel had succeeded in escaping from his dungeon. His friends in Dorsbergen stirred up a revolution, and Danton was driven from the throne at Ceres. On the arrival of Gabriel at the capital, the army of Dorsbergen espoused the cause of the prince it had spurned, and three days after his escape he was on his throne, defying Yetiv and offering a price for the head of the unfortunate Danton, now a fugitive in the hills along the Graustark frontier. End of chapter 1